All right, welcome to our last PCA. This is on modeling heterogeneity in preferences. So previously, every utility model we've discussed has usually been a homogeneous model. So let's talk about what that means. So we've used a model for utility where you have an observed component and an unobserved component. And this observed component is really just a sum product of these beta coefficients and x attributes. And we've been interested in trying to find what are the values of these beta coefficients because they describe the relative value of each attribute, x. So these are homogeneous models because everyone has the same coefficients. So even though we might have data from hundreds of people, when we estimate a model, we only get one set of parameters and the standard errors of those parameters. That's what a homogeneous model means. For heterogeneous models, this allows for different people to have different types of coefficients. In this class, we're going to cover two different approaches, although there's lots of different types. Now, the most extreme thing you could do is run a separate model for every single person, but that usually isn't feasible because we often don't have enough information about each person. Oftentimes, our utility models might have 10 or more coefficients, and yet each respondent might have only answered a few choice questions. So instead of estimating a model for every single person, one thing we can do is group people in together. And that way, we can estimate different models for different groups. And so we'll get one set of coefficients for group one and another for group two. Another approach is called a mixed logit model or a hierarchical model. In this case, we still have our baseline estimates of single parameters, beta one, beta two, and so on. Except for we're going to assume that each of these parameters follow their own distribution. So in this case, I'm saying beta 1 is normally distributed across the population. And that distribution has a mean parameter and a standard deviation parameter. So I'm allowing beta 1 to vary across the people in my survey, but I'm restricting how it varies. I'm going to assume that it varies according to some distribution. In both of these approaches, we're going to estimate more parameters than a homogeneous model. But they're both approaches that are feasible in that the number of parameters that we're going to estimate don't grow to an infeasible number. So let's start with interaction models. Let's say we have a very simple homogeneous model when we have one coefficient beta 1 and one attribute x1. Well, if we had two different groups who answered our survey, group A and group B, one way we could separate out the effect of x1 is to add in this interaction term. We're here in this term we have beta 2 times again x1, but then multiply times this delta coefficient, which is a dummy coefficient. And the dummy takes a value of 1 if the person is in group B and a 0 otherwise. And so the addition of this term is going to allow us to separate out the difference between the effects of x1 for group A and group B. Now, if you rearrange this model, you can see a little more clearly how this model works. So x1 is the attribute we care about. And here we have beta 1, and then we have beta 2 times this delta parameter. And so the way you can interpret this is beta 1 is the effect of x1 for group A, which makes sense, because if we have a group A respondent, then this term is 0, and this whole term, this beta 2, disappears. So we only get beta 1 times x1. But if the data point is coming from group B, then this, this term beta 2 gets added into the equation. And so we get beta 1 plus beta 2 times x1. So beta 2 isn't the effect for group B. It's the difference in the effects uh, between groups A and B. So if we wanted to know what's the effect of x1 from this model, for group A, it's just beta 1. But for group B, it's the sum of beta 1 plus beta 2. Another nice feature of adding in this dummy variable to account for differences in groups is we can use a statistical test to test if there is a statistically significant difference. So if beta 2 had the value of 0, or it was very, very small, or it wasn't statistically significant, any of those outcomes would suggest that there isn't a difference between group A and B uh, of, the, of the x1 attribute. Using an interaction of a dummy coefficient in a utility model in this way is the preferred approach for controlling for differences between groups. But what if we split the data and just separately estimated two different models? Couldn't we just do this for group A and group B and then compare the coefficients? Well, turns out that's problematic. And the main reason is because of this error term. 
Remember that to get a logit model, we make a specific assumption about the error term. We say it's Gumbel distributed with a mean of zero and some variance. Now, this pi squared over six term, that's just a fixed number, right? So really, everything depends on this sigma squared term, which is an unknown parameter that we call the scale parameter. And because this term is unknown, we can't really estimate this directly. Instead, what we have to do is divide this whole utility equation by the sigma term. And by doing that, our model actually looks like this. And now our scale parameter has a fixed variance. It's just pi squared over 6. OK, so this now gives us the fixed variance that we need to estimate the model. But the problem now is that we have this sigma term over here. And we can't identify the sigma term separately from the beta 1 and beta 2 terms. But fortunately, because utility is only a relative concept, this value of sigma doesn't really matter. In fact, we can just assume it equals 1, and it won't change our results. And if you think about it, all it's doing is scaling this result here up and down. That's why we call it the scale parameter. If we assumed sigma was 100, or 1,000, or 0 0.1, all it would do to our beta 1 and beta 2 coefficients is scale them up and down. And when we scale the coefficients up and down, and we put those coefficients into a logit model, we still get the same probabilities. So scaling the outcome will not affect our results. And that's why we can just assume it away and say it equals 1. Now, back over here to this approach, since we've separated our utility models into two separate groups of A and B, well, we still have this scale problem, where now we've got a separate scale parameter for group A and group B. And so we could assume that the scale parameter for group A is 1, but then we don't know what the relative difference is between the scale parameters for group A and group B. And this model becomes unidentified. So in this case, if we wanted to compare the differences in beta 1 between each group, well, we wouldn't be able to know if the difference is coming from an actual difference in their preferences or just a difference in their scale functions. So this is why this approach won't work. When we want to separate out preferences between groups, we have to do it using a dummy coefficient so that we've only got one error term. So for practice question one, let's suppose that we use the following utility model to describe preferences for cars. We have an attribute price, uh, a fuel economy attribute, and miles per gallon. And we have this dummy coefficient, elect, which takes one if the vehicle is an electric car and zero otherwise. For part A, using interactions, write out a model that accounts for differences in the effects of price, fuel economy, and the electric vehicle type between two groups, A and B. And then for part B, once you've written out that general model, write out the effects for price, MPG, and the electric vehicle type for each group. So let's go back to this simpler early model where I showed you the effect of X1 between groups A and group B. If all we wanted was a point estimate, of the difference, then we could just do this. We know that for group A, the coefficient is beta 1, and for group B, the coefficient is beta 1 plus beta 2. But keep in mind that both these coefficients have some uncertainty around them. So if you wanted to know, is there a statistically significant difference between these groups, we would need to compute a confidence interval around this beta 1 and a confidence interval around the sum of beta 1 plus beta 2. Well, we can do that using simulation just like we did when we were computing willingness to pay or market shares with uncertainty, we can use draws of the coefficients for beta 1 and beta 2 to compute this sum. So remember that our beta coefficients are normally distributed with a mean, which is the vector of the estimates we get from a model, and the variance covariance matrix it comes out of our Hessian. So we run a model, we get a Hessian, and we take the negative inverse of the Hessian, and that gives us this variance covariance matrix. So in R, how we do this is first we load the mass library, which is going to give us the function we need to take these draws. And let's say we've got our two coefficients. Beta 1 is negative 0.7 and beta 2 is 0.1. Now if you think about it, our point estimate would be for group A it's negative 0.7 and for group B it's negative 0.7 plus 0.1. So it should be negative 0.6. So let's say we estimated our model. Uh, we got this Hessian out of the estimation procedure. And then we can compute our draws by first getting the covariance matrix, which is the negative 
inverse of Hessian. And remember, in R, you use the function solve to invert a matrix. And then our draws, we're going to use the MVR norm function. So here I'm taking 10,000 draws with the mean of beta, which is this whole vector here, and the covariance matrix, which we just got from, from a Hessian. Now that we have all these draws, we can compute the effects for group A and group B. So beta 1 for group A is simply the draws of beta 1. And for group B, it's the draws of beta 1 plus the draws of beta 2. So now this object here, beta 1A, is 10,000 values of beta 1. And the object beta 1B is 10,000 of the possible values of beta 1 plus beta 2. And we can compute statistics off of these vectors. So let's look at the means. The mean of beta 1a is about negative 0.7. And that's what we would expect, right? Because the point estimate was negative 0.7. And the mean for beta 1b is negative 0.6, which again is what we would expect. Negative 0.7 plus 0.1 is negative 0.6. Then we can also use the quantile function to get a 95% confidence interval. So the quantiles for beta 1a going from 0 0.025 to 0 0.975, that spans a 95% confidence interval. But the values we get is negative 0.73 to negative 0.67. And for group B, we get negative 0.64 and negative 0.56. So we can tell that there is a significant difference between these groups because the upper value here of the confidence interval for group A, which is negative 0.67, is still lower than the lower value for group B, which is negative 0.64. So the uncertainty around the parameters between groups A and B don't overlap. So for practice question two, let's suppose that we estimate the following utility model, describing preferences for chocolate bars between two groups, A and B. Here we have the attributes price and percentage cacao. And then we interact a dummy coefficient, which uh, takes a value of 1 if the respondent was from group B, interacting with price and cacao. After we estimate our model, let's say these are the coefficients we got for all four parameters, and this is the Hessian that came out of the estimation procedure. For part A, use the MVR norm function from the mass library to generate 10,000 draws of the model coefficients. And then for part B, use the draws to compute the mean and a 95% confidence interval of the effects of price and percentage of cacao for each group, A and B. Interaction models are convenient if we already know different groups in our sample. So, for example, if we asked about people's incomes, we might want to separate out a high income group versus a low income group, and we can use interaction models to account for those differences. In a mixed logit model, we don't have to know anything about the demographics of our sample. So let's go back to this original simple homogeneous model where we only have one coefficient, beta 1, and one attribute, x1. In a mixed logit model, we're going to assume that beta 1 is distributed across the population according to some distribution. So here I've showing a normal distribution assumption which has a mean parameter and a standard deviation parameter. So here I'm saying some people in my sample might be more sensitive to this effect, so they're going to have a higher coefficient for beta 1, and some might be less sensitive and they have a lower coefficient for beta 1. An average effect for beta 1 is going to be the, the mu term. So when I estimate my model, I'm not estimating beta 1. Instead, I'm estimating two parameters, mu 1 and sigma 1, which describe the distribution of beta 1. And the main difference between the standard logit and the mixed logit is how we compute these probabilities. Remember that in a standard logit, the probability is just a simple fraction term. While in a mixed logit, that fraction is nested inside another integral, uh, which is integrating out the distribution of beta that we're assuming. Each of these approaches have pros and cons. On the standard logit, remember, it has this IIA property, which becomes a real problem if we have multiple products that have similar attributes. In the mixed logit, that property goes away, so that's a nice benefit. However, we know the standard logit has a convex log likelihood, which means that every time we run the model, we're guaranteed to get the absolute global maximum. In a mixed logit, it's non-convex, so every time we run the model, we might get slightly different parameters, and it's almost impossible to know with certainty whether we've reached a global solution. 
a good way to get some level of confidence that we've reached a global max is to rerun this model multiple times using different starting points. If we keep getting the same results over hundreds of times, then we can be pretty confident that we're getting a global solution. But we can never be 100% sure. To estimate the mixed logit model, we use simulation. So the first step we do is we draw a value of beta from this f of beta, the PDF of beta, and we label it beta r. So from this f of beta here, we're going to take a random draw of beta, and then we're going to use that draw to compute the logit fraction. So this part's pretty straightforward. We just take this beta r, we plug it in here, and we get a probability r. And then we do this many, many times. So every time we do this, we take a draw of beta and we compute PR. We store the value of PR in a vector. And then at the very end, once we've done this R times, our estimate of P sub J is the average of all of these PRs. So when we're looping through our maximum likelihood procedure, every time we have to compute P sub J, we have to do this simulation process of drawing betas and computing PR many, many times to get this one value. And for that reason, the mixed logit model takes a lot longer to run. So let's look at an example in R. Let's say we have this similar problem we saw before, where uh, we're looking at utility for chocolate, and we have a price and percentage of cacao. But instead of using this homogeneous model, we're going to assume that beta 1 and beta 2 are both normally distributed. So we're going to estimate four parameters here, a mean and a standard deviation for beta 1, and a mean and standard deviation for beta 2. Our first step is to load the mlogit library, and then we have to convert our data frame into a mlogit.data class. Remember, we have to do this step every time we estimate a model in using the mlogit library, because mlogit requires a special format of your data. So let's say we have a data frame called data, and I'm saying use this for the data. The choice variable is labeled choice, the alternate variable is labeled alt, and the ID variable is labeled ID. So let's look at what an example of this data frame might look like. Originally, my choice variable usually has zeros and ones. And the zeros mean I didn't choose it, and one means I chose it. After we put it through mlogit.data, it converts it into a logical values of trues and false. The alt variable just tells me which alternative was being shown to the respondent. So in this data set, I have one, two, three, four alternatives in each question. Each of these first four rows were the four alternatives shown for question one. And then for question two, I have a new set of four. The obs ID is telling me which question I'm on. So here's question one, here's question two. And the ID variable is telling me which person answered those questions. So here I had the same person, person number one, answer question one, and they answered question two. So once we've gotten our mlogit.data object set up, then we just run our model. The first two lines of the model are the same as if we were running a homogeneous model. We tell it to use this data frame, the data mlogit, which is what we called our mlogit.data object. And then the formula is the model, this high level model that we described, which was choice is a function of price and cacao. We put the bar and then zero here to say that we don't want an intercept in the model. And then finally, all we have to do to add this component of heterogeneity in is to tell it what this parameter r par is. r par stands for random parameters. So here within the r par argument, I'm saying price is equal to n and cacao is equal to n. And n stands for normal. So I'm saying I want my price coefficient to be normally distributed. And likewise, I want my cacao coefficient to be normally distributed. That's accounting for this and this. And so with that addition, I have now turned a, what was originally a homogeneous model into a mixed logit model where I've added two different mixing distributions for the price and cacao attributes. So for practice question three, we're going to use a real data set and estimate a mixed logit model. First, use the read underscore CSV function from the tidyverse library and use the link in the video description below to read in the yogurt.csv data frame. Using the mlogit library, let's estimate the following homogeneous model. So here I've got a price attribute, which is continuous. I have a feature attribute, which is a dummy coefficient, which describes whether the yogurt was featured or not. And then I have three dummy coefficients that describe the different brands, Dannon, Highland, 
and Weight Watchers. The fourth brand, which was Yoplait, is dummied out. That was the baseline brand. Now hint, if you're going to run this model, don't forget to first use the mlogit.data function to format your data into the format that mlogit requires. Now that we've estimated a homogeneous model, let's estimate a heterogeneous model by adding the following mixing distributions. Both beta 1 and beta 2 should be normally distributed with mean and standard deviation.